Good morning, everyone. My name is Father Pius Petrick. I'm the Vice Chairman of the Board of Directors of the Legal Services Corporation. It's wonderful to be back in New Orleans and in Louisiana, and in many ways, the sort of genesis of this disaster task force. Um, I'm here with a panel, and we're, we're going to be discussing continuum of operations planning. At LSE, we don't like acronyms, but uh, we'll call it COOP because everybody calls it COOP planning. So we'll just use that, that, that little acronym uh, for this. Um, and I am here uh, with a number of participants, judges all of whom who have been involved with disaster work and disaster recovery, either on the bench or at least within the legal system. I'm going to start on my right to give Judge Douglas a little time. We, Judge Douglas had a, a late appointment. She's going to be here, uh, but she might be a few minutes late. So I will uh, start uh, with Justice uh, Weimer, uh, who's in fact got a chair right behind us, uh, but we're glad you're up at the, at the table here with us. Um, uh, Justice Weimer is, uh, as you can tell, a member of the Louisiana Supreme Court uh, here, so one of our local judges. Uh, next to him, to my immediate right, is uh, one of the co-chairs of our task force, is Judge Jonathan, Lith Jonathan Littman, the former chief judge of the New York Court of Appeals, now of counsel at Latham and Watkins, again, one of the great supporters of our firm, and Judge Littman has been an extraordinary co-chair for this task force. To my uh, immediate left, one of the great friends of the Legal Services Corporation, the Chief Justice of the Texas Supreme Court, Nathan Hecht, um, who has seen, of course, his share of disaster down in Texas, and we're delighted for him to be with us here. And I think perhaps our newest judge, I think, is Judge Dana Douglas, who uh, recently appointed, fairly recently, to the uh, and, uh, and our, and our uh, token federal judge uh, to the Eastern District, uh, the Eastern District of Louisiana, the, United, the Eastern District Court. Uh, and again, judge, this, judge Douglas will be with us in a few minutes. Um, and we know, uh, judge, Justice Weimer, you have to leave uh, probably about halfway through. Um, so uh, uh, we'll, we'll make sure we get some good questions to you before we get to that. Uh, we are here in Louisiana, and I always also recall our meeting in Nashville. Unfortunately, today, this, this past few days, the uh, occasion of a terrible tornado that's caused great damage. And the slogan, the motto for the, the Supreme Court of Tennessee is uh, Fiat Justitia Ruat Celum, which I have always thought is a wonderful slogan for our task force. It's a Latin phrase that means let, let, the, let justice be done though the heavens fall, which I always think should be the motto for our task force and always a reminder for us as well. When we think about disaster relief and recovery, we rightly think first of those who are impacted, have lost their homes, especially those who have lost their lives, are injured, are in distress. But in the recovery period and the restoration of normality in life, the functioning of a court system is something we have to pay attention to as well. How the courts allow and are the vehicles for the return to the normal life for people to sort out all of the difficulties that occur. And an essential part of that is the planning that the courts themselves have to do. What are we going to do when there's a disaster? How do we plan for it? And so one of the items of our disaster task force report is to discuss that coup planning not only for legal services entities, but for the courts themselves. And so we're going to be talking to our panelists here today. We're also being live streamed, a little camera over there. So, so hopefully to our friends out there in the world of the interwebs who will be watching us for the next few minutes. And so first I'll begin just with uh, uh, a question uh, for all of you. You all have been involved in disasters in, in one way or another. How did these disasters impact your court systems? What lessons did you learn from it? And I'll turn first to, to Judge Weimer. I see you've brought props. I love props. So uh, I'll, I'll ask you, uh, Justice Weimer, about your own experience here in Louisiana. Thank you, Father. Uh, first, let me join the chorus of welcomes. Welcome to Louisiana, welcome to New Orleans, and welcome to the Supreme Court building of Louisiana, named for Pascal Calagero, who was instrumental in uh, revising and re revitalizing this building after it had been abandoned for many years. Uh, we actually returned to this building in 2004, a year before Katrina hit. It's, of course, located in the heart of the French Quarter. Um, Father, if I may begin with a little story. Uh, in August of 2005, August 29th, Hurricane Katrina made landfall in Louisiana and struck New Orleans area, this area, uh, southeast Louisiana, and Mississippi and all the way out to Alabama. Over 
1,800 people lost their lives. And um, New Orleans, in a lot of areas, flooded, as Judy mentioned, to its rooftops. Uh, a U.S. Army General, Russell Honore, um, a no-nonsense, tough-talking individual who the mayor at the time referred to as a John Wayne dude, uh, <laughs> said that Katrina deployed a perfect strategy. It uh, attacked by sea and by air. It came in from every angle, knocked out communications and supply lines and caused catastrophic damages. Uh, and then one month, and this is not often remembered, but one month later, Rita came across Louisiana and we learned a new term, slabbed. People referred to their homes and their businesses as being reduced to just a slab. Uh, sometime in, in the aftermath of Katrina, um, and, and Judy referenced St. Bernard Parish, and, and also this Plaquemines Parish where uh, these areas outside of New Orleans received terrible damage. Uh, the judges actually stayed in the courthouse there and it became a shelter of last resort for people that were leaving in the middle of the storm to find shelter. Um, they were being moved from their rooftops and wherever they had accumulated and brought to the ferry landing right across from here, right across the Mississippi River from here. And I got together with a group of fellow volunteer firemen from my hometown community of Thibodeau, a little small town just about 60 miles outside of New Orleans. And we got together uh, by begging, borrowing, and we, we didn't do any stealing for them. Uh, there was a term called commandeering, but we didn't do any of that either. Uh, to bring food and water and other necessities to these poor souls. Um, when I got to the first roadblock that was manned by some National Guardsmen uh, who were armed, um, I presented my credentials as a Supreme Court Justice. And uh, I could tell they were perplexed. And so I said, I'm Justice John Weimer with the Louisiana Supreme Court. And one of them said, uh, Justin who? <laughs> and I said, <coughs> said, no, I'm, I'm not Justin. I'm a justice. I'm a judge. Well, they went from perplexed to baffled. And uh, they looked up, and then they saw that I was wearing, and I still have it, uh, a Thibodeau Volunteer Fireman's T-shirt. <laughs> and one of them said, hey, bro, you a fireman? And I said, as a matter of fact, I am. He said, well, I don't know about all these papers, but you're welcome to come in if you're a fireman. <laughs> Well, the, the quick moral of that story is this, because we always have to have a moral to a story, right, Paul? <laughs> um, I had planned ahead. Uh, my credentials as a Supreme Court Justice had served me well up until that point, getting through roadblocks. But um, I learned that you need redundancies. They're so critically important. I learned that you have to be flexible and improvise and I learned that next time, and hopefully there's not a next time, I'll bring my credentials and my t-shirt. <laughs> um, I, 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 you know, I don't know if you want me to go on or, or yield to the other justices and, and judge it at this time, Father. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go around and then okay. we'll come back to you for, for the next question as well. Okay. Um, you know, when you, even with, with a hurricane, sometimes you often have a bit of advance notice, maybe a couple of days or a couple of hours, but when you have a man-made disaster like a terrorist attack, which there's no notice, and then it really cripples the whole city, that's something that's just impossible to prepare for in the moment. Uh, Judge Lippmann, we, we think yeah. about disasters, we think of natural disasters, but there are man-made ones as well. Oh, without question, and you know, I've, I've lived it, and uh, we all know the... Uh, the father is talking about 9-11 and what a traumatic event for New York, for the country, and in particular for the justice system and the courts. You know, the, the impact was devastating. We actually had courthouses destroyed, <laughs> literally destroyed, court offices, employees of the court system killed. I mean, I literally uh, can tell you, and it's, it's hard to even talk about it, of, walking in the ashes 
under the World Trade Center looking for the last time when our court officials were seen and what the uh, first responders and the fire people and the police would do, they put on the pillars that were left um, the name of the, of the officer and the time that they were seen and the date the last time they were seen. And, you know, going through and, and such a traumatic thing, having our center of operations um, unavailable. We were actually holding meetings to try and get the command structure in line outside, uh, uh, you know, the, the area where our courts were located because we had to go to a place where everyone could get to. And it was just, uh, um, uh, um, just unbelievably traumatic um, arraignments. What do you do in the middle of this thing with lockdown zones and places apropos yeah, you sure. just can't get into? And how do you arraign people? The business of the people has to go on in public safety. Um, we had so many people, volunteers, uh, you know, people, uh, and Judy, you know, the, we, we sometimes fight a battle in terms of the public image of lawyers. We had lawyers around the block and the block and the block of the Bar Association volunteering to help people. But how you kind of bring them together and coordinate it and make it something that's going to work and take all those good intentions. And remember in those days, um, we really hadn't trained people in advance. So it was a combination on the fly, figuring out what to do with all these uh, goodwill and good intentions and, and how to mobilize uh, uh, lawyers and their efforts. And um, documents destroyed, you know, you couldn't even, the courts couldn't figure out what to do with the cases. We didn't have the documents that told us as to what those cases were about, where they were on the calendar, when the, the note of issue was filed, all these kinds of things. So, you know what taught us? It, it, it taught us things that, that we've all learned since then and trying this report is so much all about and that's why I was so pleased to be asked to uh, co-chair this with the father and, uh, and uh, Martha Minow uh, because we've lived it. This isn't something abstract or something that, gee, what should we do? And, and the lessons are, are so clear and uh, a planning in advance and we did in New York, being a big system that, that we had, um, we did do some planning, but not nearly enough to reflect that, as, as Father Pius says, overnight or that minute, figuring out uh, what to do. And by Hurricane Sandy, we, had New York, we were much, much better pre prepared because of the coup planning. Uh, continuity of operations just rings out to me it's so vibrantly remember how are we going to keep the courts going with everything's going on um having a, a plan in place to make that happen chain of command how you 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 give out even instructions to what to do if you have the authority to do it how do you convey that communication with the public well well what do we do we have a case that was going to be on and so and so date or i want to file a case or you know, I was in the middle of a trial. Um, what do you do and, and how do you uh, communicate that to people? And I guess the major lesson that we all learned from these things, whether it's 9-11 or any other uh, uh, um, uh, storm or hurricane or uh, natural event, is collaboration. And, and the knowledge that we in the courts are not um, in a vacuum, separate from the public, the world around us, and we've learned very much how to that we all have to have seats at the table. And, uh, and I think that's, that sticks with us to this day and that we're all a community that want the same thing in our world at least, dealing with this abstract idea of justice and how you make it concrete and real in the midst of chaos. So um, lots of lessons that we've learned and again, I think this report highlight so many of them. Yeah, and it's a reminder that, you know, these disasters are not limited to the Gulf Coast states, but every state oh, in the union course. has to consider these. And Texas is a big state, and it's got a lot of big disasters, unfortunately, <laughs> as well. But I think Texas is, in many ways, has a reputation for its ability to handle a lot of these disasters, partly because, unfortunately, you've had so many. 
So what's been your most kind of recent disaster and how have the, how have the courts dealt with that? The most, rec the most recent one was uh, Hurricane Harvey. Um, and uh, as Rob was saying earlier, um, there's no typical uh, disaster. Uh, and as uh, Justice uh, Weimer was saying, uh, you really do have to be flexible and you have to have the planning in place to assist the, the response to it, um, but it's always, it's always going to be different. Uh, so when Harvey hit, um, it was a, seemed like a typical storm and it hit just east of Corpus Christi and uh, it barely nicked Corpus Christi, um, but it destroyed uh, the courthouses in the little counties um, just to the east. Uh, and I mean flattened them so that they just could not physically operate in those uh, structures. Um, <clears throat> uh, as Father says, Texas is a big state, and so it was very important to us in the 19th century that courts meet in the county uh, seat at the building that's designated and not meet out somewhere else where it's hard to get to. Um, nowadays, of course, you can get around more easily. Um, but we had not ever had to anticipate that um, courts could just not meet at all in a, in a particular county. They were going to have to go to some other um, jurisdiction uh, to meet. And um, so we had to adjust procedures for assigning courts, changing their jurisdiction, um, and trying to make it possible just to get the people that needed to be there for arraignments, for criminal cases, for all sorts of, th uh, you know, for uh, landlord-tenant cases, for all sorts of things, just to be able to get to the uh, courthouse. Then um, when it hit Houston, uh, it rained 60 inches in a little less than two days. Uh, and if you know Houston, um, Houston has trouble with a quarter of an inch rainfall. <laughs> uh, and uh, <coughs> it uh, struggles with that, so 60 inches uh, is is a lot uh, and flooded all of the main thoroughfares and made it uh, virtually impossible to get around uh, just at all. But again, it, it, it's very difficult to prepare for all of the um, contingencies. So the uh, Lone Star Legal Aid, uh, its main office in Houston is right downtown and downtown Houston flooded. So it office flooded. Uh, which was to be expected. Um, but the electric uh, service was in the basement. And so it short-circuited and burned the building down. So uh, Lone Star has the distinction of having its building burn in a flood. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, Sounds like all they got left is pestilence. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, just how do the lawyers were uh, wanting to come in and help but they had no place to go. So um, I'll always be grateful to Latham and Watkins and two or three other firms in Houston uh, that opened their offices uh, to legal aid lawyers and let them come in and work there. Uh, it was a little hard getting them to leave those offices and go back, <laughs> but uh, it was a great thing um, while it lasted. Uh, I never, the storm hit in the night and the first thing the next morning uh, about nine or 10 o'clock in the morning, I got a call from um, Chief Justice Jeff Bivens in Tennessee uh, saying, uh, the lawyers here wanna help and several have called. Uh, what's the best way that we can uh, help? Uh, so we were trying to um, give suggestions for how that could, how that could happen. Um, but the next call I got was uh, uh, literally, uh, was Chief Judge Janet DeFiore from, of New York who said the same thing. So it's really heartening that people um, want to help. Uh, our state bar wanted the help, uh, so we did what we've done in the past, which um, was allow out-of-state lawyers who are not licensed in Texas uh, to represent people in connection with uh, the disaster. Um, and um, you know, sometimes the the local bar can feel sort of proprietary about that but not when sometimes you're, yeah <laughs> but not when you're struggling with something uh, of that magnitude so the lawyers really turn to in Texas and then um, uh, out of state as well and then I'll just say that uh, technologically the courts in Texas are pretty strong 
um, for for courts, uh, and uh, we have electronic filing and access to dockets uh, offsite uh, and centrally, and it's redundant, and the data is stored different places to try to prevent uh, destruction in a disaster. So all of that was in place. We had not dealt with um, the uh, problem that if the if the courts are if the court technology is up and running, what about the lawyers? What about the lawyer who can't get to his office, her office? Uh, the computer is out there. Um, then what? What? Do, how? How do we accommodate them? Um, so we have the ability in Texas to change the law. The court can uh, suspend the statute of limitations, can suspend deadlines, um, can um, uh, ask the judges sit outside the local courtrooms um, and try to uh, accommodate that. But we didn't know, I don't think uh, we fully appreciated how bad it could get uh, until we saw um, what happened in Houston. And then, the, of course, uh, the needs are just uh, enormous. Um, lots of people are hanging by a thread. You know, they're very close, they live very close to the edge on good days. Uh, and so when something like this comes along, it's uh, everything in the world to them. Uh, and uh, just trying to find a, a place to stay, uh, trying to keep jobs, trying to get kids in school, uh, just the trying to get food, just the ordinary kinds of things that you don't think much of, about uh, become uh, enormous problems along with the claims and the reconstruction process and all of that. Uh, for tens of thousands of people. So it really is um, something that we have to prepare for. Yeah, I think it was, uh, I think it was MacArthur who said, planning is essential, plans are useless. Yeah. Uh, so it's important to plan, but you have to realize you can't hold too tightly to that plan because at least for, in terms of the battle scenario, the fog of war will destroy any plan, but the planning you've gone through helps to prepare you. And we're excited to have Judge Douglas with us, our, the, the newest judge on our little panel here. Um, now, I'm not sure you've been uh, judged quite long enough to be in a disaster qua judge, uh, but you certainly had a, a role as a lawyer in dealing with the legal system. I was talking to, to Dean Landro last night. Uh, one of the things that I never thought about, when you've got a disaster in a place like New Orleans, now maybe the neighboring Lafayette isn't so hard hit, but you know, half the cases in the Lafayette courts are from lawyers in Louisiana. So you open up the Lafayette courts and you open, start tolling the statute of limitations again, but no, no lawyer from here can get there. So we often think that, we have to realize that, you know, it's not just the courts that are affected and the personnel in the courts, but the ability even for the lawyers to come to these courts and handle these issues are sometimes affected and sometimes the courts have to think about what do we do if we open this up even a little too early for the lawyers? So to give you both, you know, both the practitioner and the judge's perspective, you've had some, some involvement being you know, here in New Orleans as well in, in, in uh, Katrina. So if you just want to relate a little bit of your own experience in disaster works and the legal system. Sure, I think in terms of the most recent disaster, although it didn't impact us directly, um, just maybe about a month or two ago, the city of New Orleans um, was under a cyber attack. And so all of the computers in the local New Orleans area for, for city government were um, held for ransom or what have you. And so I spent a lot of time talking to practitioners who were called into the court and didn't have access to documents, um, didn't even, couldn't even figure out for the life of them how they were going to get a, a judgment circulated to other counsel in a case to get it approved before the court or how they were going to go about um, drafting pleadings and things of that nature. And so um, although it didn't impact us as, as a court directly because our computer system was not um, tied to theirs, we still had to sort of be responsive to them to, to make sure we could find ways to assist them in um, making sure that justice happened as efficiently um, as possible. So um, that just sort of gives a, a clue um, into what we, we discussed, what they discussed earlier about these documents and plans having to be breathing, flexible documents that can sort of be responsive to the different needs. Um, not just of us as a court system, but also of litigants that we that, that come before the court. And, and, and that in turn impacts uh, the members of the community as well. Um, it, it seems like 15, it, it, Katrina was 15 years ago, which seems 
sort of like a lifetime ago, but not really. Um, and, and we were discussing this in our conversations in preparation for this call. Um, although we, we have all these mobile devices now and everybody's using text messaging and everything is in the cloud, although it seems hard to believe those things didn't really exist 15 years ago. So, um, you know, at that time I was on the practitioner side and I can recall, um, I, I was telling them I had just purchased my house in 2003 and my mom was still working for Orleans Parish Court where not only do they, ha they handle civil litigation, but they also handle the foreclosures and, and different things like that for real estate property. And um, my mom's boss at the time was sort of in char charge of that, so had a lot of knowledge about city property and things that were going on here. And I was really excited because here I am, a young lawyer, I had just purchased my house and I went in and I was like, look, look what I have, and he's like, Congratulations, if New Orleans was a bowl, you just purchased the house at the bottom of the bowl. <laughs> and so all of my excitement sort of drained for a second and I was like, okay. So two years later, what he said came true because Katrina came, um, we left on a Friday, we had family closer to Lafayette, so we drove to Opelousas with a little bag and some shorts or whatever for the weekend, it's August thinking that we were gonna be there maybe till Monday or Tuesday and ended up being there until November. And just as he said, my house, the, my two-story house took water, took five feet of water and the first floor was pretty much demolished. And so, um, you know, we, we had to figure out, it took me, I think, maybe a week or two before I realized that even though I couldn't use my cell phone, I could communicate with someone through a text message. Sounds foreign now, but we just did not know that we could communicate in that way at that time. Um, and so we had to learn a lot about how to prepare for disasters from there. Um, I, I recall my mom having stories about how a lot of the documents for civil district court and operations being held in the, were in the basement at the time, I think. And so a lot of that stuff had to be, had to figure out a way to recreate things from, from, from that source as well. And so, you know, it, it gave me a lot of a lot of background about things that we needed to keep in mind um, for co the continuity of operations with core systems and things of that nature. Um, but you know, luckily enough, we were able to move over to the the Western District of Louisiana in Lafayette and sort of work from there as best we could. But since then, we've learned and and with the um, growth of cloud technology, we've been able to make sure that all of our documents and resources were not in one concentrated place so that if something ever does happen here in New Orleans, we have some other place that things are stored that we can sort of um, pull on as a resource. Thank you. And I, maybe we can go a little bit more into some of the detail with regards to uh, uh, preparing court systems for disasters. And I'll, I'll, I'll deal with the, the, the two state justices uh, with me here. Um, in the, especially since Katrina, I, I would say, I think most states are much better prepared now to deal with disaster, one, because of the experience, but second, as we've mentioned, technology has made that, I think, somewhat easier. What, uh, start with you, Justice Weimer, in, in, in here in Louisiana, what, how would you judge the preparedness of the Louisiana courts uh, with regards to, to the next disaster? And perhaps we even have another one on the horizon with this pandemic of the coronavirus. Is, is that something that you, that you all are prepared to deal with, you think? Yes, uh, Paul, I believe we Good, are. Good, right answer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and the reason is you've read our report and implemented all of its recommendations. Mm, not just yet. But, uh, <laughs> the, I was at a function yesterday where the governor spoke of uh, implementing some plans, and we have already um, issued some plans uh, in a prior situation where there was a, a terrible flu about and we I'm going to go ahead and reissue those within the next day or so um, but you know I believe we are prepared um, let me just touch on if I may some of the things that that you know I, I think are important that, that we have implemented one is make sure so it was so data driven in the court systems and the, 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 the justice systems you need to make sure that your data um, is in secure locations and is all backed up um, and and these are all redundancies we have our computer systems uh, backed up in Shreveport which is all the way across Louisiana in the northern part of the state 
some people suggest Freeport is part of Texas, actually, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's not true. Uh, but but they are a very viable part of the state, and, and that's where we have things backed up. So five hours away from here, uh, we also have a working relationship with the Court of Appeal in Baton Rouge, the First Circuit Court of Appeal, where we could go there if necessary. And, and we have things set up to, to re-implement our system from there if necessary, and that's what we did after Katrina. Then we just showed up. Now we know uh, what happens when things happen in New Orleans that you know we, we're able to relocate to Baton Rouge. The other few things are you have to have an emergency contact information for all of your employees and develop a community, uh, a, a communication system that is so vital to get, uh, you know, the courts can't operate without their employees, obviously. And so how to get in touch with everyone for these disasters. We have numbers where they can call from anywhere where we can, you know, reconnect with our employees. Um, you know, you put in a plan, in, in place a plan, and then you rehearse that plan, and uh, you build in redundancies, and you know how to reassemble your staff and your key employees. Uh, we have the COOP plan, as everyone does, and annually it's re-evaluated, revised, you know, uh, employees come and go, so you change all of those contact information, all that contact information, and, all, and who's in charge, and what's the order of contact so we have that all in place uh, as indicated by the judge and others cell phones were practically practically useless during Katrina uh, but text messaging did work but you know you never know um, you know it, as as judge Honore said I mean uh, general Honore said knocking out the communication system blinds us all so you have to have redundancies there uh, a lot of Katrina, it was Pony Express, we referred to it. You <laughs> literally had to go to a place to talk to somebody mm -hmm. and then <coughs> convey the message. Um, and, and that unfortunately happened often, but you know, hopefully we're in better shape now. Um, things like payroll and paying vendors uh, and, and, uh, is critically important. And, and another uh, need often is how to house key employees and their family. Uh, we actually have um, arrangements with hotels here in New Orleans um, that, uh, if necessary, we can locate the employees, but they're not going to go anywhere without their families. And so you also have to provide for them also. And, and you know, the, the key is just to plan, 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 and build in redundancies and, and, and um, be flexible and innovative and creative because um, ultimately these plans uh, will have to change because of the, uh, the next disaster that, that comes in. I have to unfortunately excuse myself as we indicated earlier. I have some adjudicative functions also today. You've got your real job to go back to. <laughs> well, this is part of the real job too. But, uh, I thank all of the panel members and it's been very instructive. Uh, some of the things you said brought back some really disappointing and sad memories, uh, not only for the tragedy suffered in New York, but the tragedy that was suffered here also. Just, um, you know, handling such simple things as arraignments or handling such simple things as, uh, unfortunately, parents continue to fight over their children yes. um, in the middle of these disasters and want to file emergency uh, writs. Uh, and, and you know, trying to ensure that our system of justice continues to operate. And the public takes for granted that we're always going to be there. Yes, we'll like yes, that. Yes. You know, we can just subject. literally, yeah. Uh, I want to commend in, in departing the Legal Services Corporation for being America's partner in equal justice, and to borrow a phrase, if I may, and uh, and thank the Legal Service Corporation for all that it does. Uh, I see Frank Nuna there. Frank was. Uh, president of, had the unfortunate experience of being the president of the State Bar Association during Katrina and did just remarkable work at that time. Um, we were able to uh, put together a trailer to house the indigent defenders in St. Bernard Parish, which went a long way to re-establishing re our system of justice in, in that small community. 
thank you all, and, and again, I apologize for having oh. to leave early. No, no, we understand, and thank you uh, for your participation here. And, and thank you as well for the hospitality of the, of the Supreme Court of Louisiana. Yeah. It's a beautiful venue for us to thank hold this so panel, much. so thank we're, you we're very much. We're proud of it, but we're also proud to, uh, to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Well, we, we mentioned Texas. Uh, Shreveport, well, Louisiana. <laughs> uh, so we'll turn to you, uh, Chief Justice Heck. Uh, you, in many ways, uh, we were influenced in the report by the actions of Texas in its own disaster recovery. The Texas rule with regards to out-of-state lawyers, I think, has become a model for a lot of other states. But uh, what's been your, uh, how prepared is Texas for the next one, for the next hurricane? Or well, we uh, hope we're prepared. Um, and. Um, uh, Justice Weimer's remarks reminds, uh, remind us that the devil is in the details. Um, so you think about um, employees trying to get to work, but then you think about employees trying to get home and then what to do with their families. And uh, the, uh, we think, well, we'll get emergency phone numbers for everybody, but then the phones don't work. And that certainly happened to us in Harvey. We, the um, the uh, uh, cell phone service just uh, was gone in lots of places. Um, and I think the, the warning is always that uh, you have to keep working at it because um, the, uh, these uh, plans that we put in place and structures that we hope will hold uh, are um, ultimately fairly fragile. Um, so we, uh, like everybody, uh, store data different places, um, and we try to store it as far away from we think there's going to be a threat and in multiple places. Um, but servers fail, and, uh, and they uh, fail unexpectedly. So uh, our court a couple of years ago, uh, the, uh, the server in-house went down, uh, and we said, well, that's no problem. We'll just go get the backup up in Waco and bring it down and we'll be going and we'll be online again in four hours. Well, that server went down. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, there's no connection. It just so happened uh, that both of them uh, went down. Well, uh, there was a third one, but it was in Amarillo, so you had to go way out there <laughs> to, get, to get to it. Um, and ultimately it was fine. Um, but those are the kinds of contingencies that you have to kind of uh, be ready to constantly adjust to. And then the other big thing that um, I don't think we have worked on as hard as we need to, uh, and that is lawyers want to help, they don't know how. And so a lot of this is work that they don't usually do. Uh, and um, so yes, um, family frictions and problems uh, do get worse, sadly, in disasters. Um, and lots of lawyers would be willing to help with that. They just don't do family law, and they wouldn't know the first thing about it. Um, when people were filing FEMA claims um, during Harvey, uh, we needed lots and lots of help with that. And lawyers uh, throughout Houston and elsewhere were volunteering to help, but they'd never seen a FEMA claim in their life. Uh, and they didn't know what where they were going to do when they call up uh, some administrator and say, what do I need to file? And the administrator says, look, I've got thousands of these on my desk. You need to go figure it out and don't come back till you do. Um, so there, and that would be a constant um, uh, uh, training, uh, putting together materials that can easily be uh, accessed by lawyers and say, okay, this, I'll, I'll go handle all of these domestic violence cases that are coming up in a disaster. You just park me down at the courthouse and, and I really will help with the um, prosecutors or whoever else is, legal aid folks or whoever else is involved. And then we, we mustn't, uh, we, we've got to be sure that we're doing all of this um, in cooperation and collaboration with the government players. Um, so. Uh, we need to constantly work with FEMA, I think, uh, and law enforcement and others who are going to be involved in these disasters as well to try to make sure that we're all on the same page, we're working toward the same end, 
uh, and to smooth things over because um, delays in, in claims like this and getting back into homes and getting your kids in school. Um, Paul Furr at, at Lone Star Legal Aid said one of the problems they had in um, uh, Harvey was that people with children downtown would, because it's all underwater, would send the children to um, relatives further out, out in the suburbs. But then when the relative tries to take the children to school in the suburbs, the school won't let them in. They, they say, yeah, they say, uh, you know, you've got to have some papers, you've got to have some reason to put the kids in here. And the other problem, which is perverse, uh, is that uh, those, uh, that permission is hard to get sometimes because at least the schools in Texas get paid on the average daily attendance. And so if kids aren't going to school in Houston and they're going to school out in uh, the suburbs, that directly impacts the budgets of the downtown school. So it, very complex um, situation uh, involving lots of different motivations. And I, it's not one that I would have anticipated. I would have just thought people would have pulled together on that. But uh, uh, that it's that kind of kind of training for the unexpected that we need to help lawyers. Yeah, and I, and I think you raised a good point that coop planning it can't be done in a vacuum. It can't be done in a silo. That coop planning has to be done in the context of a whole community with, with regards, to, especially with regards to the other players and state, federal, and, uh, and even the local governments and even private enterprise as well. Uh, judge Lemon, um, you were a chief judge. Uh, you were a judge during a disaster. A disaster hits. What, what's, what's the first thing a judge should be doing, other than obviously taking care of his family well, and the immediate needs? I, I think taking care of his whole family. Yeah. And that family includes your professional family and your court colleagues. I think, you know, that, that first and foremost, safety of, of uh, again, you have your own personal issues, and I'll tell a war story in a second, but um, the, the safety of litigants, of court staff, should be paramount when these things hit. You know, sometimes we're so driven and focused on, you know, on our docket or whatever, <laughs> that, that what's more important than, than human lives. So to me, that's, that's the, the first and foremost uh, uh, um, issue that we have to deal with. Getting the information that the judge needs to make intelligent decisions, you know, is, is so good. You don't know what's going on around you. You can't decide what should be done to help uh, uh, ensure the safety of all the people who are depending on you. And I think getting the word out to, to everybody, depending on your role, whether you're the chief judge or a rank and file, a judge in the courtroom, Getting the word out to others about well, what's going on inside the court is paramount because if, if we're operating in our own little world and no one else knows what's going on, it's not helpful. It really isn't. And, you know, when we talk about these, these safety issues and understanding what's going on, being able to uh, um, have your own life and do what you have to do. And I told a story um, along the lines that you're talking about that. You know, when 9-11 hit and I'm, you know, running this, this gigantic uh, organization and trying to get the people, figure out what's going on, get the information, ensure everybody's safety, I can't, my son is clerking in the federal court in downtown Manhattan, and I can't find them. I can't get this. So on the one hand, you're doing, you know, do this, do that, oh, let's get that, let's go over here, and, and I could not find them. And, and not to get, to, you know, the way these things are, you know, uh, uh, there are so many stories to be told. He walks out of the, the subway down in downtown Manhattan and sees people throwing themselves out of the building of the World Trade Center, you know? And, and you know, and, and you're hearing these stories and I don't know what's happening, trying to find him. And finally, you know, and I'm having the, the the secretary, again, we're doing 60. Can you just keep trying this number again? The cell phone coverage was so uh, difficult. And finally, um, I found them um, with the cell phone moving halfway up Manhattan, you know, towards where he lived. 
out of the zone, you know, of the World Trade Center, and what a relief, and then you can go back and say, okay, now let's, but, but I'm saying there, there are, there are this responsibility that you have as a court official, and, and as someone who's preserving justice, and yet, you know, there are things, so many things that can, that can distract you, and you can't not be distracted, <laughs> you know. But by saying, Tucky, finding that balance and being able to do it all is a great responsibility. Yeah, it's, when we think about it, the courts are thinking about the way in which they can deal with the victims of the disaster, but of course their own employees are the same victims of the disaster. Yeah, absolutely. And to try to balance that a little bit, a little bit uh, can be very challenging. J Judge Douglas, any thoughts about that, about how you're able to respond to a disaster and the victims, and yet at the same time deal with some of your own court personnel who are victims themselves. I think the most important skill that you can have in disaster preparation is being able to anticipate the unanticipated, you know, expect the unexpected and then being able to respond to um, the unexpected and the unanticipated under pressure because each disaster um, that I have experienced has been unique in its own right. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, Katrina, you know, we, we can, we, we talk a lot about Katrina, but people rarely ever talk about Rita. So we had all these people moving at the end of August from Katrina. Everybody thought to move west, or people were displaced in different places around um, the United States. But then came Rita. And so even though people were moving towards Baton Rouge and Lake Charles and Houston, Rita came in and sort of hit that area too. And so as our law firm at the time was planning and as the courts were planning on um, perhaps moving some of our records and things like that to Baton Rouge, we learned that those places were also, you know, open to exposure for, for, for different um, disasters. The place that I winded up um, evacuating to Opelousas, Louisiana, I think within a year or two they had been hit. And I never in a million years thought that they were in a place that, you know, that they would have to experience some of those disasters. But so many different um, disaster events are happening in places that we never thought they might happen, that it's kind of hard to, to, you know, dot the I's and cross the T's in the, the confines of a, a co-op plan to figure out how to respond to each one of them. So you really just have to have someone who's flexible enough to be able to work under pressure and figure out how to deal with these things when that happens. Um, in terms of our priorities, I have a staff of three and a half. I have a judicial assistant, a law clerk, and a law clerk that I share with, the, with another judge. And it's always when one person goes on vacation that we realize how essential that person is to the functioning of our court system and the accessibility to the courts. And so to imagine everyone being displaced in different places and trying to figure out how we come together to make sure the court is as accessible as possible, as quickly as possible, um, you know, you, you realize how essential those folks are to making that happen. And so I do think it's very important to make sure that each person um, is, is stable enough somewhere in their environments um, before you can even move to the step of making sure that the courthouse can function in a place um, and in a way that it, it needs to function. Yeah, the best plans need good people to implement them, yeah. and we've got to be always cognizant of that. We just have a few minutes left of, the, of this panel, so I'd like to just ask each member of the panel to just give their final thoughts about uh, the, e either the, dis or the disaster plan that LSE has put forward or your own kind of final takeaways with regards to uh, planning for disasters. Judge Lippman? Well, uh, you know, I think that, that so many of the report recommendations resonate with me, but some more than others. And I think that uh, I'd emphasize first partnerships. You know, we talked a lot about it today. I think that Nathan uh, mentioned that, that, that you can't do this you know, as a justice system, you know, in its own uh, 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 little tunnel. Or, uh, this is all about um, everybody having a seat at the table in the broadest the strokes. And the, the report talks about the different players that, that, that matter. And, uh, and I know with, with our situation in New York today, and we did a meeting recently uh, in New York City at the Emergency Command Center, where we saw that everybody has a seat at the table. Everyone on the said, we're all talking to each other, and that's how you get through these things. And I think that that, that, that particular issue, if uh, obviously, and build those partnerships, not on the day that this is happening or that week, but in the days and years before. So, so I would emphasize that, this, this, this community 
that we're, we're a part of. An old saying in disaster recovery, uh, the day of disaster is the worst day to exchange business <laughs> cards. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> Justice Hack's final thoughts? Yeah, nobody wants a disaster, and for that reason, you're just sort of loath to prepare for disaster, <laughs> disaster um, because you don't want to recognize that it may happen. Um, and so the, the wonderful thing about the report is it just keeps that issue before us all the time. And uh, it, it has the recommendations uh, from that we can use uh, to build on in particular circumstances. Right now, um, of course, we're worried about the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. uh, and Texas, like a lot of jurisdictions, uh, has uh, a law that allows for involuntary quarantine, people that resist uh, treatment for the virus, but it's a very specialized law, and um, most of our judges have no idea that it's even there, let alone what it says. We have 3,220 judges in Texas, and there's 254 counties. There's no way in the world you can train all those people. Um, so how can you get resources to those kinds of things uh, that are as different from Harvey as um, they could possibly be, and yet at the same time, they do sort of um, involve some of the uh, ideas and recommendations and uh, the basis of the LSC's uh, report. So uh, this has been very good work. Thank you. Judge Douglas, a, a, a final report? Yeah, I think events like this are very important because it gives us an opportunity to um, confer with folks from around the country who have had very different experiences from our own. And it helps to inform um, what we may do if we're, we're caught up in that situation where you have very little time to think about what to do. Um, you just try to move forward, um, and at least it gives you some resource to pull from and, 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 and some other you know, contacts and, and folks that you can collaborate with in order to come up with solutions to some very unique problems. Thank you. And please join me in thanking all this esteemed panel for, this, for today. <laughs>